Good morning. Good morning. Today is 29 March, the year 2024. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum with a fellow volunteer, Diane Thompson, and special guest, uh, Shelley Kotlars. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of uh, Seaman First Class Lou Kotlars. Uh, Seaman Kotlars was a, uh, a sailor aboard the uh, battleship uh, New Mexico in the Pacific during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Uh, sure good to have you here, Lou. Okay, Lou, first of all, would you please state and spell your full name? My name is Louis Kotlars, L-O-U-I-S-K-O-T-L-A-R-Z. And when and where were you born? I was born in Havana, Cuba, uh, the year 1927, February 6th. 1927. And uh, making you how many years young now? 97, going on 98. There you go. All right. <laughs> um, so why were, how old is it that you were born in Cuba? My parents immigrated from Europe. My father came from Poland. Uh, my mother came from Russia. Uh, where she was born in Russia, I cannot remember. My father was born, I believe, in a uh, city called Korov, K-O-R-O-V, in Poland. And uh, he emigrated across Europe because he was, I think he was asked to join the, uh, the Polish service when he was about 16. And... Uh, he didn't think that was a good idea. That would have been about what year when he oh was God. before this, World War I? Before, or? Uh, this was before World War I, yes, mm -hmm. that is correct, yeah. absolutely correct. Okay. And so he emigrated across Europe and uh, he was adept at picking up uh, the various language skills. He was a French, Russian, Polish, he could speak Polish, uh, and uh, it was, I believe he moved into, uh, he lived in France for a couple months. He picked up a little bit of French and Spanish. He was very good at Spanish. And when he uh, left uh, Europe, I can't recall, somehow or other, he and a few of his friends that he traveled with uh, arrived in uh, Mexico. And uh, I believe there was a limitation on, in, on uh, individuals coming into the United States at that time. So they stayed in Mexico for a period of time and then uh, he uh, moved into uh, Cuba. He thought it was an easier place from Cuba into the United States. And he was in Cuba for about, uh, I'd say, eight or nine years. My mother, uh, she was living in Cuba at the time. And so uh, that's where they met. My dad had a, uh, a ladies' garment manufacturing company that he created. And I was born uh, in 1927. And uh, what was your father's name? My father's name was uh, Jack. Uh, they called him Jacob. And in uh, Yiddish, the word is Yankel. Okay. So... Was part of the reason he left uh, Poland the pogroms and stuff they had? And yes, there was the issue of pogroms always there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scene in Europe already was changing uh, drastically. And uh, many people were beginning to make decisions on leaving Europe. And uh, he, came from, uh, he came from a family of about four brothers, three or four brothers. Uh, of that family, about uh, two, two or three survived over the period of the years. The others perished then. 
And so uh, this was the main point of uh, coming, of trying to get into the United States, which he did. So, and what was your mother's name and her maiden my name? My mother's name was, in, uh, in Yiddish, it was Rochel. In other words, it was Rachel. Yeah. Her uh, maiden name was Barkin. Uh, How do you spell that? B-A-R-K-I-N. And she had a brother. And his name, I believe, was Nathan. And they both came from uh, Russia, too. Mm -hmm. And um, so he had a, a, he started a garment factory in Havana? That's as far yeah. back, yes. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, my, I don't think my father had much of an education. I don't think he went beyond maybe sixth grade. Yeah. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Do I have any brothers and mm -hmm. sisters? Uh, I have one sister. She passed away. Uh, she was about five years younger than me. And uh, what was her name? Her name was Betty, same as my wife's name. Okay. B e t t y. Betty Northman. Mm -hmm. She lived in Los. She uh, resided in Los Angeles. And how uh, how long did you live in Havana? How old were you when you left? Actually, I was about a year old when I left, about oh. a year, a year and a half old when I left Havana there. And uh, that's when the, uh, my parents emigrated to uh, the United States. And where, where did they? So it was at that point they were allowed to come or could they yes, come? Yes, yeah. That, that's right. At that point they were allowed to enter. And so uh, they did... Uh, and I think through the area of in the area of uh, Texas, Galveston, in that area. Mm -hmm. The reason I think they uh, came into this area here was they had friends. They had made friends in uh, uh, Havana, and so these friends had relatives living in Chicago, oh, okay. and so uh, they persuaded my parents. Why not come to uh, Chicago? So and basically, so, you grew up in Chicago. I right? grew up in Chicago. Yeah. Okay. I lived seventeen years. Uh, yeah, I was uh, up until seventeen years. I lived in uh, Chicago until what, I enlisted in the service. What part of Chicago? Well, it was on the South Side. White Sox fan. A bigger part. A White Sox fan. Uh, Chicago side. Cubs. You were a Cub fan. Chicago though. Cubs, yeah. They're on Fingles. the north side, though. They're on the north side, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago, right. I can remember the address on which we lived. We lived 1755 Division Street, near, near Ashland and Division. Uh -huh. So called points would be the elevated trains, streetcars, <laughs> uh, buses. But streetcars, uh, mainly, that was the main. Uh, way of getting a bone yeah. in that time. So you're a Cub fan. Do you remember uh, who were some of your favorite players on the Cubs? I, you know something? I'm not much of a sportsman. Oh, okay. So you're asking me <laughs> about a sportsman. No, I'm not a sports <laughs> not person. Not a sport My person. daughter is not going to like that very well. <laughs> but uh, at that time, no. Yeah, okay. uh, I played baseball baseball in the streets like everybody else. So I was just going to ask you, what did your kids do for fun when you were growing up? What did we do for fun? Mm -hmm. uh, played in the alley. We played in the alley. That was our game. Couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for summertime to come because uh, at that time in the Depression, there was not exactly uh, well-cultivated uh, greenery all around the mm -hmm. city and so on. And so uh, we played in the alley and played in the streets and so on. We ran around. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the neighborhood you lived in was it ethnic or it was a mix. It was an ethnic neighborhood. There would be uh, Hungarians, uh, Polish, predominantly Polish, uh, a Bulgarian. Uh, in the words of Carl Sandburg, the poet of Chicago, he says, "This is a city of big shoulders." <laughs> working class people, mm -hmm. many, many churches, Sundays, the church bells are ringing continuously, which they probably are doing now. And so it was strong ethnicity all around. Everybody got along pretty well? Yes. Yeah, you, I mean, they we're living in a, a four-story, five-story, six-story uh, apartment houses, retail businesses, you know, grocery stores, Tailors and so on on the, on the ground level push uh, 
grocery stores with their boxes outside and the fruit mm -hmm. and everything out, pile on top, sitting on the doorstep outside. And the air conditioning, no. non-existent. <laughs> you want air conditioning, you hire an ice man, and they would lug the ice upstairs on their shoulder. Yeah. My grandfather did that in my hometown, Evansville, Indiana, down south of you. A little okay. Ways. <laughs> um, and um, your father, did he uh, start a business then? Or yes. Uh, he came to Chicago. There's no trade, but he had the skill of, you know, being in business in uh, Havana. So he went ahead and uh, decided, well, to go in business. He didn't have any cash or nothing of the sort. And so his friends said, get a push cart. Get a push cart. And... Uh, put whatever you want on it. And the street to locate the push cart was a street called Maxwell Street. Maxwell Street in Chicago. This was a street of all immigrants living. And uh, each push cart, a wagon, whatever they had, <clears throat> was selling something. <clears throat> they were selling clothing, another was selling umbrellas, another was selling shoes. This is a means of uh, existing, living. You did what you, what you knew, and that would be basically how to sell and trade and back and forth. And he would sell all different kinds of stuff or anything in particular? We sold all these. Sold, uh, <clears throat> I remember a picture of uh, him standing in front of a, a push cart, and there were uh, window shades. The, the roll-up window shades, they crisscross like, uh, like uh, rifles. Okay. And uh, there were socks, shoes, shirts, and various other small things and so on. Yeah. Was your family very religious? Did you go to synagogue a lot? As far back as I can remember, <clears throat> I wouldn't say we weren't extremely religious. We carried on the faith. We carried our faith on and so on. And uh, the synagogues were not uh, were located either in old buildings, and uh, my uh, going to synagogues would be with my parents, and this would be strictly for the holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, the language we spoke in the house would be uh, uh, Yiddish, or my parents, as they say, if they didn't want us to understand something. Uh, they break into uh, Polish or Russian or whatever, or uh, Latin, and uh, I should correct, not Latin, but Spanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the upbringing right there. And this was during the Depression. But I remember uh, going from Maxwell Street, they upgraded themselves, and they rented a store, and the store had uh, was a ladies and men's clothing, shirts, shoes, underwear, and everything else. And I believe the mayor of Chicago at that time was Kelly. Kelly. If you needed anything done, if you had to have things taken care of, complaints, uh, you'd reach your uh, alderman. The alderman would come around door to door, and they would write down your the problem, and they would say, uh, we'll take care of the problem. And my dad would give him a pair of socks. <laughs> Thank you, and take care of it. The problem was taken care of. One, two, three. Good old days. <laughs> Good old days, right. <laughs> um, so where did you go to grade school? I went to, uh, I cannot remember the name of the grade school. <clears throat> uh, I cannot remember the name of the grade yeah. school in Chicago. I did go to a grade school. I remember the things of going to the school. <clears throat> what I associate the grade school was uh, just buildings all around me, uh, warehouse buildings all around. Going to school, uh, I would say, uh, I remember the classes. That was the first time I heard the word French. We were learning, uh, we were being taught French. My English skills were not very good at that time. And so uh, that's when I began to uh, uh, hear things, different languages are spoken. And 
very cold, brutal winters off Lake Michigan and so on. I remember running from school because I was being chased. <laughs> How, was, it, was the school very far from your home? I would say maybe perhaps a distance of about a, a mile or so because I remember uh, walking there all the time, walking there, no streetcars to yeah. take or anything of that sort. Yeah. Well, um, and did you live in a house or an apartment or what? We, I, uh, <clears throat> we lived in the back of a store. My uh, folks had the store, the business was in front, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no wall. We had a large curtain drawn across the back of the store. Behind the curtain was the quarter. And the quarter was uh, a cast iron stove in the middle of the room. In the sh uh, coal was in the basement. And um, my father would go downstairs to get the coal. And then when I was a little bit older, maybe six, he says, you can bring up the coal now. So I brought the coal over in the basement and dumped it inside of the, uh, the stove there. Uh, kitchen, all bedroom, everything was in this, large, in this one room. And uh, it, the room was divided by, no walls, divided by curtains, separated. Uh, nowadays when they say to children, or they say many things, Many times they would say, uh, people would say, why don't you go out and play? If you want to go out and play, nowadays you go to a schoolyard or something. When they asked me to go out and play that, then go into the alley. So and that's where you met your friends. <laughs> you and your sister and your mom and dad. My sister was five years younger. At that time, they, uh, no, she wouldn't go out. No, no, I know. But I mean, that's the four of you were living. That's exactly that, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, where did you go to high school then? I went to high school, a school called Wells, W-E-L-L-S, Wells High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, how far was that from your home? I'd say maybe another, well, I was walking distance, so I would say maybe about a mile, a mile and a half. Remember any favorite teachers at Wells? I remember, I remember a math teacher, personality-wise, I remember a teacher that taught uh, what they call shop, shop, and uh, art. Mm -hmm. I I focused in mostly on the art, visual presentation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think you you said that you do oil paintings. Uh -huh. or, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk. Well, when did, when did you start doing those? Uh, I think basically it wasn't exactly oil. It started off. I was watching someone sketch, and there was a project <clears throat> given to us. And I watched someone. I wasn't doing uh, a good job of uh, copying. I wasn't focusing, and I noticed somebody else doing a better job. I, I said to myself, "Well, if he can." do it, I can do it better myself. Was that in high school you're talking about? That was in grammar school also, oh, oh, and it yeah. carried into high school oh, a little okay. bit. Yeah. Uh, I believe uh, I was about 12 years old, 11 or 12, when my, I don't know how they thought of it, my father, I didn't, he had no knowledge of art, and he... <clears throat> He suggested I go to an art school on Michigan Avenue. I forget if it's a Michigan Michigan Boulevard, across from the, uh, uh, the Chicago uh, Art Institute. And I used to take a streetcar to go downtown, and an elevated train transfer onto an elevated train. I used to go there about once or twice a week to a professional art studio. Everybody there was adults. And uh, I'd never been in a surrounding like that. Uh, and so I, I, to this day, I don't know how they could afford it for me to go to school. And that's when I, uh, I kept up this uh, the paint, uh, drawing and so on. Painting I picked up years later on. Mm -hmm. Do you have any 
uh, favorite girlfriend, any girlfriends in high school? She was a baker's daughter. Are you ready to be bleep? <laughs> A baker's daughter. A baker's daughter. <laughs> yeah. My parents would always say, how come you smell of, of dough, <laughs> of pastries? That's when I come home. You want to delete this or not? <laughs> what was her name? Rosalie. <laughs> Rosalie. You want to delete that one? <laughs> um, did your father have a car? Yes. I don't know why. He didn't know how to drive, but he bought a car. <laughs> The reason he bought the car is because everybody else, uh, we had a uh, salesman come to the house, to the store. We'd have a uh, salesman at that time, we were traveling, and the salesman would have their merchandise with them. And so uh, whenever a salesman was due to come, uh, I would uh, nag my father to have them give me a ride in the car, which was a major, major thing. And so... Uh, one day my father says he's going to buy a car. Somebody drove the car <clears throat> to the store and then uh, he didn't know how to drive the car back. <laughs> it was a Dodge, a 1937 Dodge. Wooden spokes. <laughs> Wooden spokes, heavy what, fenders. What color it was? Black and, uh, black and a sort of tan. Window shades in the rear with little uh, flower holders on either side, and a trunk like a box in the back. Two door or four door? Four door. Four door. <laughs> with a crank in front that you crank oh, really? to start. Yeah. The question is, what are you going to do with this thing? So uh, uh, they told me you have to rent a garage, and so we rented a garage two blocks down the alley away from us. And he parked the car there. And he didn't take the car out. We'd have to go out every Sunday. When it was snowing, the weather was terrible, we'd go to the garage. We had blankets on top of the hood to keep it warm. <laughs> this, I don't, this is European thinking. <laughs> and so uh, we'd crank, my dad would crank the car up. It would start, it would run. And uh, we'd walk back. And he says, I just drove the car. <laughs> I think about 1939, he began to take some driving lessons in the car. Um, so you, obviously, so when you, um, your friends, um, uh, did, was there a, a neighborhood movie theater close by your house in your neighborhood or did you go to the show? Yes, we did. Uh, I can't remember the name of the theater. But uh, I remember the movies, they uh, used to advertise something entirely different. Big banners, big banners outside the theater called, it's uh, air conditioning. <laughs> air conditioning inside. What does air conditioning mean? What does air conditioning, you know? This is something new. And uh, the movie theater? What were, they were showing Rin Tin Tin. Like on Saturdays? Be Saturdays, on Saturdays, Saturdays, yeah, and Saturdays. Cartoons and... Yeah, there was the no news. such thing as popcorn in the lobbies or, uh, you know, exclu mm -hmm. uh, exclusive seating and so on. Uh, to go to the movies, uh, my uh, mother would fix up a bag it would be either salami, and pickles, and corned beef, and so on, and we go to the theater. After I multiply that by maybe about twenty-five or thirty other kids there with the same uh, diet, when the movie was over, they had to fumigate the theater. That's how bad it was. But at that time, they were showing news, and they were showing coming attractions. Mm -hmm. One after the other, one after the other. Yeah. Sometimes they would have a cereal also. Yeah. I mean, Flash I Gordon was yeah. that and so on. <laughs> um, what was the favorite meal that your mother cooked that you liked the best? Uh, she made a meal. It was, uh, she made a variety of meals, European meals, a lot of potatoes, a lot of starch, and so on. And... Uh, 
uh, there was one that uh, was our uh, favorite, and it was called kokletten. It's a Polish word for oversized hamburger. So she made hamburger with garlic and onions and so on, loaded it up and with coleslaw, and there would be potatoes on top of that. And uh, that was a, one of the, the better meals we had, so-called. We had other things, yeah. but uh, yeah. the, um, there was no such thing as gourmet, uh, like <laughs> Bobby Flay and yeah. Julia, <laughs> the famous cook. Um, when you went on a date, when you took Rosalie out, where would you go? What would you guys do? <laughs> Actually, you couldn't go far. I didn't have any money in the depression time. We'd walk. Yeah. We'd walk, and then she said, you want to go back to the bakery? <laughs> it was a whole new scene altogether. No place. Was there a hamburger joint in, or anything like uh, that? No, there was a, maybe a, that was perhaps a delicatessen. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that when I grew up in that period of time and so on, uh, there were not these restaurants that you have nowadays. Uh, there was a rest, uh, you had to go to the grocery store to shop. No supermarkets at the time. Uh, there was one market in the downtown area called Stop and Shop. And that we thought was phenomenal because it had a variety of things organized. But basically, it was the grocery store you go to the grocery store and you need, let's say, a can of beans or a can of something or other. They had a, a hook. They reach up, they click it, pick up a can off the shelf. No calculators. <clears throat> Whatever you purchased went into a bag. And they uh, wrote on the bag exactly what per was purchased. And they calculated mentally, very quickly, all the options. Could be ten items and so on. Done. Uh, was Al Capone still around when you were growing up? Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, you think of Chicago in those days as kind of gangster ridden, but I uh, did you have any? Did very your father, did your father get shaken down or anything like that? No. Uh, shaken down? Yeah, well, the, the only I understand. No, other, the only other, time other than the socks. <laughs> yeah, well, the only time no, he wasn't shaken down. The only like I say, well, yes, you could put it that way. Let's say if uh, he had uh, some, uh, for example, we have a. I'll give you an example. We had the, the storefront had a a large entryway, a vestibular. When it's windy and cold, the newspapers would flow into that area, pile up. Chicago had a tremendous amount of saloons, taverns, and so on. Comes the weekends, everybody would drink. The paychecks would come and they would go out and they would drink and they would enjoy themselves and so on. Afterwards, those that were not feeling well or so on, they used the large driveway, uh, the entranceway over there, as a place to unload their, uh, their habits. <laughs> Those words, the vomit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, this was a nuisance. A nuisance. So my father would call up again, the Andrew, the uh, the alderman, and they showed up immediately, and he told them, "Look what's going on over here." So he says, "I can't stand this. I can't tolerate this. This is not the right thing." He says, "I'm a businessman." <laughs> so he says, "We'll take care of it for you, Jack. That's not going to happen anymore." This time, my father upgraded him and gave him a shirt and a sweater <laughs> instead of the socks. That was taken care of immediately. Did I remember anything? Yes, I do remember. I remember the Biograph Theater, the lady in red, and John Dillinger. I remember on the radio we heard that John Dillinger, John Dillinger was coming out of the movie theater with this woman in red, had red hair, uh, I believe she was from Romania at the time, <clears throat> and they caught him coming out of the biograph. That was the signal. They said that she would be wearing a red dress, <clears throat> and I remember the report coming in on the radio. Mm -hmm. I remember also talking about was a, a radio show called Gangbusters, 
and there's Ma Barker and Machine Gun Kelly. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, this we heard through the radio. Mm -hmm. So it was constant, constant. We heard uh, shootings going on in Chicago, the assassination and bookmakers and racetrack betting and so on. This was the area. Were there bookies in your area that you knew of, or anything? I didn't know like any. Didn't know I know. Anything. Yeah, I know. There were there were uh, there was bookmaking going on and so on. Yeah, it was wide open. Chicago was a wide open city, and all these things here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, what year did you graduate from high school then? Forty four. Forty four. Okay. Okay. Do you remember what you were doing December seventh, nineteen forty one? That's Roosevelt. Uh, no, December, 7th. December 7th, the bombing of, uh, of Pearl Harbor. You were listening to? Yes. I can't exactly, I don't recall what, it, I remember on the radio we heard this. Yeah, it was on a Sunday. And right, the, Sunday the, afternoon, think the bombing of Pearl here. Harbor, yeah. right. Right, okay. And, and uh, so that while you were in high school, for the next couple <clears> of years before you graduated, <throat> did you keep up on what was going on? Yeah, that was constant. The radio was on now. The radio was on. And the uh, Chicago Tribune and the newspapers in Chicago constantly filled. Uh, newspapers were sold on corners. Newspapers, yeah, they yeah. would have newsstands. Newsstands would carry all of the news and so on. And the radio had an exp uh, had its limitations to a point. But uh, you uh, read a lot. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that was memorable. The next thing I heard after the the bombing of Pearl Harbor was everybody listened to uh, Roosevelt. Right. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt make his speech to uh, Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, and so you knew what was going on. Did you pretty well, pretty much know you were going to end up uh, in the service? No, I didn't. <clears throat> I. <clears throat> Excuse me, I knew I was aware, my friends and I, and all, we knew there was a war going on. And I remember my father at that time receiving a draft notification. He had her sign up for the draft. And a lot of my friends were, were a year older than me or so, were enlisting. And there was an atmosphere prevailing and you knew things were changing. Things were changing drastically and you hear the drum beat, you know, of uh, war, 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 enlisting and uh, and so that got me thinking for a period of time and then uh, when I turned uh, 17, you know, I had never left Chicago. The only time I left Chicago was to go to Springfield, Illinois to see Lincoln's uh, tomb. And then I sent a postcard from uh, uh, Springfield, Illinois to my parents back home. Six months later, the postcard arrived. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyhow. Uh, Did you go with your high school class to Springfield? Or? Yes, we went to, uh, to Springfield, Illinois, yeah. the high school class. Yeah. We took a train up there. Mm -hmm. This was a momentous occasion. I'd left home already. <laughs> yeah. I was gone for about eight hours. <laughs> so you graduate in 44, then what? And and, oh, oh, let, let me back up just a little bit. You still had relatives in Europe. And did you, did I, your father have any contact with them during they, the war? I can, that I can't, he's, yes, they, he had, uh, he had some contact with them. He had a brother that lived in, that had come over when he was in uh, Havana at the time from Europe, stayed with him in Havana for a while, and my, my uncle then moved to New York. They brought another brother in, my father brought another brother in from Europe, and things were really churning turning badly, and he encouraged him to stay, but he was lonesome from the writer he called. He was lonesome, he wanted to go back to the family. That's the last time they ever saw him again, you see. Uh, 
there was a different, uh, a different atmosphere, a different feel of things changing all over. And the word uh, depression began to fade away. <clears throat> began to fade away and uh, you began to see pictures of uh, uh, women, wax, w, the wax services, women going, being called up, joining nurses, and you see that famous picture of uh, Rosie the River with the mm -hmm. muscle and so on. Mm -hmm. All of these things beginning to come at you, you, you suddenly make up your mind, what am I doing here anymore? Everybody's gone, my friends are gone, so I decided to uh, go ahead and enlist. I didn't tell my parents about that. They did find out, they went right through the roof. So the comment was, who would want you in the service? And that's about it. <laughs> and uh, so you jo uh, why did you join the Navy? Oh, uh, patriotism. I mean, as opposed to Army oh, the Air Force. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. I couldn't make the weight. I was underweight. So I had gone uh, to the, uh, not the Army, because of what I was reading, and all the soldiers that are going out and being killed and various and I said, you can get yourself, I mean, you could really get hurt in the Army. <laughs> so I thought, maybe I'll join the Coast Guard. The, I got turned down at the Coast Guard, underweight. I got turned down at the Merchant Marine, underweight again. Uh, How much did you weigh then? About, I would say maybe a, a hundred pounds or less. Uh, Air Force, mm, I didn't know anything about that. You know, height, who wants that? And so I went to the, I figured I stopped in at a naval office. And uh, there was a, uh, a recruiter, what they call a bosun's mate. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? He says, you lack weight here, so you need to bulk up. So I said, how much? And don't forget, I spoke English, broken. And so I said, how much? He says, I don't know, three pounds, two pounds, whatever, just, just to make the way. I went back home and I told my parents, I have to have more bananas. I need bananas. <laughs> so my folks said, we can't afford bananas. So we have apples and bread and matzah, you know what matzah is? Matzah is unleavened bread for the Passover holidays and so on. So I began to eat that for about a week or two. <laughs> and I walked into the naval office there and I got on the scale and he says, you made it, you made it, you made it. In the meantime, I was home, came home, had a large belly. <laughs> You can cut this if you want. I was constipated for two weeks after that. <laughs> Are you laughing? <laughs> <You're good. laughs> my daughter's going, I'm going to hear that from my daughter. <laughs> Next. Well, let's go you know, expound a little bit more on what you started to tell me, why you actually joined the military then. Well, it was uh, an act of, uh, you know, patriotism, really patriotism. And uh, I felt very proud. You know, I had left home. And I felt this is, I'm going to contribute myself to the war. And uh, that was the first time I have ever left on my own. I was sent out to the uh, uh, Great Lakes Naval Training in, Chicago, in uh, Illinois. I was there for about six weeks of uh, boot camp training. That was pretty close to your home, right? Uh, yes. Uh, my home was in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Right. And Great Lakes was no more than a short while <laughs> a distance away. Yeah. Did you get get to go home any during that training period? I believe uh, I had an opportunity to go home maybe several times, and that's about it. Okay. And what was the training like for you? Well, that was a whole revelation. I had never experienced anything like this before. Uh, I had never been home, away from home, shall I say. And here I'm uh, in boot camp with uh, people from uh, surrounding states. 
and uh, different backgrounds, uh, the dialects of the surrounding areas were entirely strange to me. And uh, it was uh, uh, an awakening. I had never been uh, in a situation where I had to be, where the situ it demanded uh, obedience, basically, and learning to take orders. <clears throat> and uh, I was, I noticed uh, that I was surrounded by uh, a good deal of older men, older uh, personnel. Uh, they could have been their early twenties, so on. But to me, at seventeen, everyone looked older. Uh, what what time of the year was this? I would say it would be somewhere about January or February. I know it says in the winter time, very cold, <laughs> and so on. And uh, and you had to do a lot of your training out outdoors. We did a lot of our training outdoors. A lot of the training was done outdoors, and. Uh, I found the uh, the rule of keep, uh, going to bed at a particular uh, time in the evening and getting up in the morning. Uh, I would say it was disturbing because I wasn't used to that, and uh, it was a revelation. It was quite a revelation here. Were you in pretty good shape? Did the, was the, did the physical exercise part of it bother you much? The exercise bothered me a little bit. I, I wasn't used to exercise, mm -hmm. and I wasn't used to uh, the routine of being so physically active so early in the morning. But uh, after uh, a few weeks or so on, uh, I adjusted to that. It became the normal, so it, uh, it didn't bother me well. What was, the, what was the food like? The food was entirely different from what I was used to eating at home, <laughs> and uh, I would say the food was the food was okay. The food was uh, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, I had never eaten this sort of a food. The diet was entirely different, but uh, I, I accepted it. I accept the fact that this was the time you eat breakfast, you have lunch at this time, and then dinner time, <laughs> and there, there's no such thing as snacks later on in the evening. There was no such thing as that whatsoever. It was all right. <laughs> um, and your drill instructors, what were they like? Uh, how did they treat you? The instructors were uh, uh, very, I thought they were very authoritarian. Uh, they were doing their job and that was to instruct people and to, li and to understand and obey orders and commands. And uh, like, uh, like uh, any situation, you like some instructors, you didn't care for some instructors. It's the way they presented themselves. All in all, they accomplished their job. And uh, <laughs> I was in no position to uh, right. make a judgment call. <laughs> Did you have any idea where you were going to end up? I had no idea. I really had no idea. Uh, I think I went on leave after six weeks. I went back home for about a few days. <clears throat> and then I came back mm -hmm. uh, to Great Lakes. And uh, at that time, I went right ahead. Uh, we were told to pack up and uh, we were going uh, to the Pacific Coast. And I remember boarding a train, and we went out to the uh, area of the uh, to the west coast. And uh, I, may, I remember we made a stop somewhere in uh, New Mexico, and we went out. We uh, got off the train, did physical activity, and then we moved on again. And I think uh, we. Uh, arrived in, I think, Long Beach, California. Long Beach was the destination. In Long Beach, I, uh, we were there for uh, a few, uh, maybe a week or so on. 
was a that, lot of paperwork involved. Uh, yeah. Was that a, a troop train? I mean, was it everybody on where mili was military, or do you remember? I can't recall. It was a transport ship of some kind. I mean, the train. <clears throat> well, the train. Yeah. <clears throat> No, I found the train was a, an ordinary uh, the, train. Uh, yeah. There were other people, they weren't just military then. Like they were military, mostly military. Mostly military. Mostly military, military yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, then in Long Beach, did you do a little more training there or you were just there? We were just there. We idled our, you know, we waited, we waited. Is that the weeks. first time you've been to California? <laughs> that was the first time I had left the state of Illinois. <laughs> and so we wound up in California, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was quite surprised to see the large ships docked and uh, just the expanse of water and the movement of personnel along the docks. And then uh, I believe they told us one day that we will be shipping out. And there was a transport that took us from uh, Long Beach I believe it went to Pearl Harbor. <coughs> and this was uh, March or this April? April, somewhere. April, somewhere in the area of April or so on. Of 40... 44, 44. somewhere. Okay. And... Uh, Did you... And you, obviously, you if you... You probably remembered that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, you know. Yes. Did that you I, see any uh, <clears throat> effects of that when you got I can't there? recall. I can't. Uh, everything seemed uh, very obscure at the time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of movement, a lot of activity. Yeah. And your ship, do you remember the name of it? The transfer ship to the Pacific, I, I cannot recall. Yeah. Was it by itself or were there in a convoy type of thing? Oh, uh, There were probably a few ships that... Uh, uh, left uh, Pearl Harbor area. No, I mean, no, no, going from the States to Pearl Harbor. I believe there were a few. Okay, I can't okay. recall exactly. And did you get seasick? No, I, uh, I never uh, got seasick at all while I was in the service. Mm -hmm. It's just that when I arrived back in the States, <laughs> getting off the ship, this was back in... Uh, in uh, Massachusetts, I lost my equilibrium Whoa. getting off the ship. I don't, this is you unbelievable. Were not, you were not a landlubber then. No, I, at that time I was not. <laughs> so, um, so when you got, you saw some of the devastation and stuff at, after when yes. you were there. And yeah. And then, so did you? Is that when you got? Um, orders to the New Mexico or? Yes, uh, then we uh, received orders that uh, we're going to be boarding a, uh, a ship at that time. And uh, that was the uh, USS New Mexico. And uh, what? No, it's a battleship. It's a battleship. And yeah. how, when was it, uh, when was the keel laid down on that? or? Uh, that's how old was it, do you know? From reading some uh, information on the, uh, the background of the uh, ship, I think it was commissioned, I believe, in 1918. Mm -hmm. About 1918. And so it was already an older uh, vessel. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, how, um, what the complement of the crew, how many? Complement on the ship like that, I'm assuming would be somewhere like about uh, 25 to 3,300 uh, personnel, mm -hmm. all told, yeah. yeah. And um, you had, uh, how big were the guns? On, on what they call, uh, well, impress me what they call 16 inch. 16 inch, yeah. 16 inch, yeah. Right. And they had a range of two or three miles, I think, probably something like right. that. Yeah. I was, uh, when I boarded the ship, uh, I can't recall how, how we boarded the ship, but uh, I do recall there were rope ladders on the side for 
climbing aboard and rope ladders going down for various other duties and so on. I was, uh, I was surprised to see uh, the, the immensity of the, of the, at the time of the, uh, of the 16 inch uh, bombardment weapons and uh, the various, uh, they call 50 millimeter caliber machine guns mm -hmm. set around here. Mm -hmm. uh, the deck. I I never knew that. I thought the battleship, all the carriers were, the decks were metal. Mm -hmm. The decks were wood. Teak, teak, I believe. Yeah. Right, right. Very similar to uh, aircraft carriers and so on. Right. But uh, what uh, the decks are what uh, grabbed my attention. <laughs> Which, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. That's. Yeah, I knew aircraft carriers. Had, I guess I didn't realize that some of the battleships had wooden decks either. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, the idea was that it uh, you can be faster. It, it, it your ship doesn't weigh as much, so you can build up more speed. That's uh, precisely precisely. Uh, the duties I had on board ship. Were of, uh, were of the right, uh, the variety kind. Basically, chipping and scraping and painting <laughs> and uh, household maintenance, basically uh, up general household work, cleaning up and uh, taking care of, uh, of uh, areas in which you lived. Uh, I know that I uh, spent uh, Many many months in a hammock, and I, I never. Uh, it took some time to learn how to get in and out of the hammock, yeah. where I felt comfortable enough. And uh, I believe the uh, the ensigns of the higher rank officers, uh, they had stacked bumps. Okay, yeah. Did you get used to that hammock after a while? Yes, uh, I got used to it. Uh, it became a uh, almost second nature to mm -hmm. mount it up, take it down, <laughs> climb in. Oh, so you took it down every day? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had to remove it mm -hmm. and store it, as they say. Yeah. Uh -huh. So were you in, like, the ship's company? Or is that your... Uh, uh, group that you're a part of doing all this stuff? Yes. Uh, they had the... Uh, uh, the seamen, the lower rank uh, uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was always uh, things to do. They kept you busy. You were always doing. And uh, I, want, uh, I began to wonder, well, this is not what I read about in the papers or so on. I mean, I, I didn't even do this at home. I didn't even do any cleaning or dishes or uh, scraping. But uh, there were assignments. Little by little, you were given assignments what to do. Uh, in the storerooms, in the uh, uh, handing out of uh, uniforms and various things. I also did, uh, I, I worked in the, uh, one of the assignments was working in the, uh, in the office, uh, typing. I never knew how to type, uh, but there were office things to do. Uh, there's, I know there's a thing where you cross the date line and there's, a, did you go through that? Yes, the international. Uh, what is it? The international date line, I believe, something like that. Yeah. The international date line. Uh, we were told about that. I didn't know what that meant at that time. What is that international date line? Although we were forewarned. Interesting. We were forewarned by, by a naval officer, a medical naval officer, who uh, stressed very emphatically that we we were, as he said, topside. That uh, we not stay in the sun or avoid the sun as much as possible when you're working out there because you can get a severe sunburn and so on. Uh, so I didn't, I dismissed, I didn't pay much attention to it. I did stay out a little long without, uh, I don't really recall if they had any uh, suntan lotion at that time, <laughs> but uh, I got burned and uh, I got burned and then I was reprimanded for that and uh, 
I wouldn't say it was confined to a quarters, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they gave me less than minimal things to do uh, until I got the picture <laughs> of yeah. obeying and listening to orders coming back and forth. Yeah. Um, so when you left Pearl, what part of the Pacific did you go to? Uh, we traveled in the direction of, we were heading in the direction of uh, Guam and also in the direction basically of the Philippine area, the Philippine region. I remember uh, hearing amongst the personnel on the ship about uh, a naval vessel that was torpedoed and the person of the ship sunk and a lot of the personnel perished. Uh, was it the Annapolis or well, something like that? Indianapolis was one for sure, yeah. Right, the Indi and uh, they were all talking about the gossip was uh, uh, the personnel that uh, uh, wound up in the water and so on. There was sharks, sharks and so on. Yeah. This was the gossip, and everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody was uh, concerned about this, you know. And uh, this is the general gossip. They could grow bigger; they can get out of hand and two on. Mm -hmm. So, did you make any good friends aboard <laughs> ship? Uh, not too many. Not too many friends. Uh, one individual I uh, <clears throat> I became friendly, at least sort of a mentor to me. I didn't realize this, but he was also the uh, sort of washed over me because I was young at that, very young. Mm -hmm. And I remember he was a he had a Polish name, and he was the what they called the the peacetime Pacific boxing champion at the time. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, he could protect you then. <laughs> right. <clears throat> this came in very handy when I wound up uh, doing a shore patrol in the mm. Philippines. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. some of those things. Do you remember his name? I cannot recall his name, but I have, in my mind, I have a, a, a good mental picture of him. Yeah. Uh, not very tall, mm. bald, <clears throat> but. Uh, all shoulders and chest, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very broad individual. So, when you were, uh, were they practicing with the guns? Any? Yes. And, and you didn't have any ear protection. I, I can't I recall if we had any ear protection and so on. Yeah. Uh, they let me shoot some of the guns. Yeah. And then they said, "That's enough." <laughs> and I know the assignment was. Uh, passing the uh, shells. They were mm -hmm. stacked up in a tray. <laughs> pretty, he pretty heavy, weren't they? Yeah. And uh, I noticed they trained us to hand these shells out of cases, so one to another, mm -hmm. and then uh, mm -hmm. to hand it to the gunner. Right. Yeah. Mm. Now, <laughs> at that time I said to myself, well, now this is more like it than <laughs> scraping the side of the, or the hull of the ship. <laughs> and when you were, did you have to get like in a ladder down along the side of the ship when you were doing that? And where, yes, I, uh, <laughs> I'm being a little afraid I'd fall, fall in yes, the water. Yes, uh, yeah, that took a little, uh, uh, I didn't even get seasick at that period either. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't forget I was young, and I was quite agile, and uh, uh, I watched what the others, I mean, there was no training, there. they didn't give you lessons on how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you were told what to do, mm -hmm. and they, and watch what the others are doing too. So if the others were going to do this, I'll do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, going over the side with scrapers and brushes and so on, and looking down in the water, mm -hmm. this was an entirely different perspective and look. And then I began to wonder, I began to see that this is a massive, massive ship, and so on. I didn't realize the, the significance, the immense... Uh,
look of this ship. And uh, I began to have a little bit more respect for it, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, so you, uh, Guam, we had taken Guam by the time you got to yeah. that area, and the Philippines, we had gone back to the Philippines. Yeah. And so, I mean, you were talking about short, and I had you uh, seen it, by the, by the time you got to the Philippines, had you seen any enemy ships or planes or anything like that? No, I saw a lot, of, a lot of activity, a lot of activity. <laughs> And were signal. you in a task force as such? I mean, did you have a carriers nearby, or? And uh, I noticed a few carriers, and I would call. Uh, yeah, there's. And they be some of our planes would be surfing, surfing around, around and stuff. Yeah. Surfing around, yeah. You know, you were in a different area all of a sudden, and uh, there was a different, there was a different look and a different feel that uh, was created just then. And uh, uh, conversation was a little bit different. Uh, there was always constant gossip, a rumor of what was going on, what's, what was happening. I spent a good deal of time, a good deal of time in, on the ship in that area, in where? Leyte Gulf. Oh, Leyte, yes. Leyte Gulf. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and through now that, that, there was a quite large battle of late. Had that been previous to the time you got there, or did that uh, come later? Uh, no, these, these battles, uh, some of these, uh, I think uh, we came in, I came into the area where uh, it was sort of winding itself down already. Mm -hmm. Winding itself down. Uh, I didn't see, uh, no sunny days, but always clouds, clouds around and so on. And you're talking about shore patrol, were, were, was that Manila or what area, where were you when you uh, left the, you were on shore patrol? Uh, I'm trying to think of the time, on the late time we were uh, anchored off, uh, I, can't, I can't remember if it was uh, Quezon Bay or Leyte, mm -hmm. but I'm on a shore. <coughs> was I prepared for shore patrol? Uh, no, uh, I wasn't prepared for shore patrol. I was told to strap on the weapon around your, uh, the weapon they gave you. Uh, did I have any experience uh, using a, a gun? No. <laughs> and uh, that's when I had my uh, mentor, my friend, assigned to me and he said, you come along with me and uh, stay, stay by my side. And, uh, and he kept, uh, he kept uh, the weapons. I was thin. Mm -hmm. The belt with the cartridges and everything kept sliding down and he kept pulling it up. <laughs> and uh, I think in the shore patrol, this is all th along the beachfronts, along the beachfronts, and that's when the, uh, there was a lot of uh, beer, so beer came off. Uh, they had these small uh, vessels that ran food and they resupplied the ships at night. So they also supplied uh, rations to go ashore and uh, eat and carouse around, mm -hmm. and we had to be back on shore patrol, we had to be back uh, at a certain uh, hour. <laughs> they would pick, uh, pick us up, and we came back on the ship, there was a head count to make sure that everybody is back on. Uh, Did you have any problems with any of the sailors mm -hmm. getting drunk or whatever? No, no problems. <laughs> uh, no problems whatsoever. Uh, no, I can't recall, no. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't worry about getting about them getting drunk. But, you know, I had my mentor with me, so when he yeah. when he says stay close, I stay close. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so from the Philippines, uh, you did. Uh, I guess by this time you didn't have a R and R uh, at Liberty at any place. No. To this point. <laughs> at this point, no. Yeah. Okay. 
the only time we had, the only time we had, uh, let's say, recreation would be movies at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd come on deck and they would announce the movie of the week. <coughs> and by announcing the movie of the week, what they call the scuttlebutt, we knew automatically that we were going to be doing labor when that movie was over because uh, we got on deck and that they would show the movie. And I cannot recall if one was Casablanca or not, but prior to the movie ending, I could hear the engines. You could hear engines, and you'd have these uh, flat bug, flat uh, bedded carriers come alongside, and they were stacked with supplies, oh, okay. Re resupply the ship, which meant. You became a stevedore. <laughs> I'm a stevedore. Oh, that's a new occupation. <laughs> a stevedore, yeah. And that, uh, <laughs> as they say now, that was a bummer. <laughs> that could go on for maybe about a couple hours. Yeah. And so, I assume that, depending on the seas, if they were rolling a little bit, they were trying, to, trying to carry something really heavy and right. keep your balance and everything, it's really right. not easy. Right. <laughs> they had uh, some hoisting equipment that went down, they lift it up, we swing it over the side, and then uh, we had to hand shove from one another. And uh, <laughs> the other thing I kept in mind was powdered eggs. Powdered eggs. Yes. Yeah. Couldn't stand it. And, <laughs> but I, I noticed also cans of spam. I had never seen or tasted anything like that. And uh, small little things I had never encountered in my previous life. <clears throat> uh, these all were new. Yeah. New tasting. Awareness of new products coming to market and so on. Yeah, I remember my mom used to fry spam, and I really liked it. Spam sandwiches were. <laughs> I understand. I read an article. I read an article in a magazine not too long ago that Hawaii was the largest. Hawaii was the is the largest consumer of spam. <laughs> Which is very interesting because now spam is made in a variety of ethnic foods, oh, mm -hmm. and uh, so you can see how things change over the period of time. So, then, when when you left uh, the Philippines, where did you head? The Philippines. We moved into the area of, uh, I believe, in the Okinawa area, and. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of kamikaze activity in that area. A lot of kamikaze area, activity in the area. I wasn't involved in too much. I was aboard the ship when um, on uh, the U.S. Uh, New Mexico. I boarded that ship probably about I can't recall about a week or two after a, uh, a second kamikaze had hit the battleship. And. Uh, uh, Tremendous amount of confusion. Uh, you were on the ship when I the, boarded when, the ship when it hit. No, no, it was just that. about a week before that. After after, after that, it. okay. Had anybody get hurt? Uh, there was casualties. I cannot recall the amount of casualties, but there were significant casualties, and uh, I could see the charred and burned areas that. Uh, scorched the metal all around, the deck was scorched, and so on. Uh, so much uh, disorganization, rampant gossip continually, and uh, complexion of everything changed. Afterwards we were told, I cannot recall how many, it was a week, a couple of weeks after or so, and we were told we were 
moving into the Okinawa, uh, Okinawa area. And then I heard there was gossip, next, it was constant gossip, gossip, uh, that uh, there was talk probably uh, invasion of Japan, invasion of Japan, things. Right. Uh, that <clears throat> After that, I could not recall too much of what was occurring uh, until, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> but we knew, we were aware of the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When did you, when did you first learn about that? Or do you remember? I mean... I think there was an announcement made. Was. Okay. Announcements made. And uh, you couldn't comprehend the numbers. You couldn't comprehend numbers okay. at that time. <clears throat> and uh, I think after that period, things got jumbled. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We did go into the Bay of Japan at one point. Mm. And there were photographs taken of our aircraft carrier. The battleship. The battleship, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, photographs taken of the battleship in front of uh, Mount Fujiyama. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The mountain, the prominent mountain, there was snow on top. Uh, things got a little bit fuzzy, hazy. Did you did get involved in any t typhoons, really bad weather? Uh, no, no, the, uh, no bad weathers, I didn't, uh, no, we weren't involved in any bad weathers, but I know so, uh, the sea was very, very, the uh, high mountains of water, so the sea rose mm -hmm. and dropped, which lifted the bow of the ship up and down. Uh, I remember there was also talk that we were going back uh, uh, there, was, there was talk about the is it the aircraft carrier, the USS Missouri, mm -hmm. in which the peace treaty was signed. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there was talk about this super, super aircraft carrier in that region, but what was the purpose of it? I, didn't, I can't recall what was the purpose of it at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I do recall uh, destroyers coming alongside our ship and the heaving of the the ship up and down and there were officers being transported <coughs> by boats and sea, what do they call it? Yeah, it's uh, a boats and sea to yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. they right. would shoot right. ropes or connectors mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. the cable and, and, cable and the officers would get into the cable see, yeah. And we, kind of like a, sea, a sea li uh, ski lift. Kind of yeah, like. and the, the, the ship would heave up <laughs> and the destroyer would be down and mm -hmm. up and these officers were transferred. And then these rumors became very rampant about something big is happening because uh, they were transferring officers off of our ship. <laughs> and... Uh, You know, the time and place has become a little bit fuzzy now. Yeah. It's lost. <laughs> so, um, how did you get back home and when did you come home from the Pacific? We were informed... <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> after the signing, mm -hmm. we knew something was, going to, something was going on already. And there was talk that uh, the USS Missouri a peace treaty was being put together, and uh, was a general, I believe, MacArthur, <clears throat> mm -hmm. involved and so on. And while this was going on, they said, that we're, we're turning around, we're going back to the States. And uh, this was a sort of a puzzle to me. All of a sudden, we're, all, we're doing all these things, and now we're moving back. <clears throat> And uh, it was already 
early 45 or so on. I think the peace treaty was signed. Uh, I think that was in September. Uh, the bomb was in August, and then September. They okay, so this so is when we were right. Um, right so this is when we were going back. Yes, and uh, I think they announced that uh, we're probably going to be na navigating uh, south toward the Panama Canal. Right. Figure. I didn't have too much geography knowledge at the time of the Panama Canal, where's <laughs> And so they say, well, we're going to be going to the Panama Canal. We stayed in the Panama Canal. I think our, our ship was having trouble getting through the canal at that time. It wasn't as broad yeah. mm -hmm. or large as it is in now. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into the Panama Canal. Uh, we went ashore for about three, four days, five days. A lot of carousing going on. And then <laughs> as the, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, general gossip. Uh, the war is over, or we read it, or we heard it. Uh, we didn't have the communication like they do now. <clears throat> and uh, after we left the Panama Canal, we went up to uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, up in Massachusetts, we docked at. Uh, oh, I, after we docked in Massachusetts, we picked up our gear and everything else. They said we're going ashore. And going ashore <laughs> on the gangplank, the ship and the dock, the ship, you know, squayed a little bit, a little bit of a lurch. I think I lost my equilibrium. <laughs> and that's when I got nauseous. Yeah. All the time I see, no. Going off, it was embarrassing. <laughs> uh, that's when, uh, funny thing, we we had liberty for about a week in Boston Harbor, and uh, out of nowhere, officers were coming in with uh, paperwork, <clears throat> and. Uh, they notified us. I don't know, I can't recall how they notified us, but they came in with the paper. I remember paperwork, all of a sudden, a lot of paperwork. Officers were coming in, and uh, then they started handing out paperwork alphabetically, according to your last name. And some of the questions came up, what are, what's this for? What's happening? What's going on? And then we found out, you're going home. It was a like a schism, an abrupt change. Here we're in the Pacific, here we in Boston, and here they tell us, go home. And uh, then the, the commotion, the war is over, and the war is over in Europe, and the Pacific, and everything else. But the, uh, that, was, that was the thing that uh, really caught my attention and began to puzzle how quick things can happen. Mm -hmm. In other words, the area where you hurry up, hurry up mm -hmm. and wait, mm -hmm. and hurry up and wait, this is hurry up and no wait. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so they said, go home. Now, you know, you're not prepared. All of a sudden, you're not prepared. Did you go home on train? <laughs> what? A train? I, I a took train. a train. <laughs> took a train to, back to uh, Great Lakes, Great Lakes, uh, I picked up some more papers, and uh, we had to sign papers and documentation, take photographs, and, uh, and I collected some money that I accumulated. And I had to ask, I had to ask directions <laughs> how to get, take, where can I get an elevated train? At so that time, my parents had moved out of Chicago, about 1946-47. And they made the mass move, like everybody was, to California, because California was the golden state. Right. And the expression of the streets were made of gold and so on. So I had to figure out, how am I gonna get to California? That was the change, that was the up change. <laughs> 
So how did you how did you get to California then, and when did you come out here? Went to California about 1947, I believe, 47. Uh, I arrived in Chicago from Great Lakes. I went, <clears throat> I don't say I went back to my neighborhood, but uh, my parents who lived there and had a business, <clears throat> they closed the store, had sold it, and I was already in communication with them I, by telephone. <clears throat> and they said, we're in California now. <clears throat> get on a train and come to California. I didn't even know how to buy a ticket. That's how naive I was at all the time. <laughs> so how old were you at this time? What is that? A, uh, about 19, yeah. somewhere about that. I meant to ask you, did you write letters back uh, when you were on the ship back? Uh, and did you get any letters from your parents? Yes, you I received the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I wrote letters. I wrote letters to them, and uh, I received letters, and the letters were always delayed, long delays. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked for copies of the Chicago Times, the uh, Chicago News, the Times. I was following. Uh, I had developed an interest in a. Uh, a columnist by the name of Irv Kupsinet, and he wrote for the Chicago the tabloids, mm -hmm. and he wrote of all the gossip and with the political maneuvering. And I was fascinated before I, I read that, and I was fascinated before I even went in the service. So I said to my parents, "When you send me mail, send me copies of the Irv Kupsinet." <clears throat> And I asked them also, send me some food and so on. What came, I think, was peanuts or something that was that wouldn't perish along the no. way. Mm -hmm. But there was, uh, I got mail. Mm -hmm. I sent mail. I got mail, and uh, the most dis uh, very disheartening when they're passing out the mail, they're calling out your name. They're throwing the Letters that when you didn't get mail, uh, that was devastating. I would get maybe one or two letters. I would see others receive reams of mail, reams of mail. And, uh, I was envious. I was envious of that. But that's the way it went at that time. So where were your parents living out here in California at the time? They had moved out here. They sold their clothing store, and they moved out here about 1946 or 47. They moved to Los Angeles. Uh, they had friends that were moving to Los Angeles, and so they decided to follow them there. And um, my parents bought a house. I believe the address is 331 North Sweetser. <clears throat> they bought a house then. In L.A. proper or one of the... In West Los Angeles. It would be in the area of about... <clears throat> uh, the area of about Melrose Avenue. Melrose near La Cienega Boulevard. <clears throat> and uh, they bought a... Uh, they call it duplex. Mm -hmm. There was rent control. And there was sugar, gas rationing still in effect. So uh, you, uh, I was allowed to come back and live with them. <clears throat> uh, you could not move a tenant out because of the controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were very few automobiles on the street in Los Angeles, uh, on the residential streets. And uh, because they hadn't uh, made any new cars since like 1941. That is correct. Until the end of the war, yeah. There was also no uh, 
no freeways. Mm -hmm. No such thing as the word of free. What is a freeway at that time? There was no such thing. <clears throat> and uh, you look in the, you look through the uh, into the mountains, where the large Hollywood sign, Hollywood Land, mm -hmm. stands, and uh, all you saw was practically bare, bare mountains. Now the proliferation of the homes and so on is entirely different now. Had your father started a new business out there? He he looked around uh, what to do. He, he had to familiarize himself with Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. His first venture was to buy the house. And uh, he didn't do anything for a few years, however, at that time, uh, when you bought a home, you're on a realtor's list, so you had constant calls from realtors calling to say, I've got a, I found a location or an investment. Mm -hmm. And so we had realtor, realtors that would come and pick up my parents, and they would say, uh, we have a piece of property we'd like you to look at, and it's in the valley. And so my father didn't know what the valley meant. And they would say, well, it's the San Fernando Valley. How do you get there? We're going to go through the Hollywood Hills, which meant like uh, taking a street like Crescent Heights, which had a road, Crescent Heights going up into the hills of Los Angeles, which meant twisting and turning rows, and there was no, not very many home populated in the area. And uh, you go down to the valley, and Ventura Boulevard was the main entrance there. Ventura was a dirt road, blacktop and dirt road. And one of the realtors took my parents to a, a home, <clears throat> wide open fields. <clears throat> It's a small, it was a small mom and papa ranch, <laughs> retiree. And uh, my parents are not from the ranchers <laughs> or farmers. And they said, this is a for sale. This is an example. There were avocado trees. My father had never seen anything green trees, avocados, mm -hmm. orange trees, lemon trees, <clears throat> chickens. Uh, coops of chickens. The smell of chickens was in the air. <clears throat> and they said, this is up for ranch, maybe about two acres, three acres. And my parents, I believe my father told me, I don't think this is for us. And he said, we're not farmers and <clears throat> I can't. And how am I going to get the eggs from the chickens? And, and they said, well, you have to go around and <laughs> collect them and so on. He said, no, I didn't come out here to be a farmer. <clears throat> and so they said, this is a goodbye. He said, no, I'll go back to the city. And so they drove him back. The area they were pointing out was Encino. <clears throat> a few years, about a, a couple of years later, they called him again. And they said to him, Jake, we found a place out in the valley. Maybe you ought to come and take a look. So. <laughs> Again, they picked them up, they went into the valley. <clears throat> and uh, again, it was chicken farms, retirees, and so on. <clears throat> and they said, uh, my parents would ask, what is all this land, all this thing over here, what's going on over here? They said, the same thing as chicken, t you can become a, a, a farmer, a gentleman farmer. And uh, my mother and father from, were not from that. And my father would ask, what is all this activity in the distance going on? And they told him, they're putting up a couple buildings over there. They didn't give him too much information. And so he says, no, I'll, I'll forget about it. And he went on to other businesses. That property that he was showing in the valley there, in the distance that had a couple buildings, was the site of the Kaiser automobile 
Henry Kaiser automobile mm -hmm. factory, which eventually became part of Kaiser Permanente Hospitals in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So he turned down. He turned down these number of opportunities. You couldn't think that far in advance. Some people could, some people didn't take advantage. But he went into other real estate businesses in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Okay, real estate, yeah. And so what did you do then? I was, uh, I didn't do much for about a year or two. I was trying to get my bearing of what's going on. And so I decided to go to school under the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And I went to the, uh, uh, an art academy on Highland Avenue in, Chicago, in L.A. Highland Avenue, L.A. From there, I, uh, I spent about uh, two or three years there. I was given assignments to uh, jobs like in the May Company, in their advertising department, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Broadway Hill department store, in their advertising department. I did advertising work there. And I spent some time uh, after I left the department store and, and left the uh, art schooling. I went to work at uh, Northrop Aviation. Uh, Northrop Aviation was located near the Los Angeles LAX airport. I wanted to work there as a draftsman. Did I know anything about draftsmanship? No, I didn't, but I had the art experience, so I picked that up very, very quickly. And I followed that routine for a few. I lit, uh, yeah, I worked at the uh, <coughs> Northrop Aviation until, uh, and I lived with my parents at the, at the time at the home. I wasn't making enough money yet. Do you remember what the, uh what they were working on, what prototype aircraft? Or Raman? Anything? When you were at uh, uh, North, Northrop, yeah. Yeah, I believe it was a, maybe it was a Grumman, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. What kind, it, it was all uh, drafting, and I, mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a, mm -hmm. I was told basically to collect, mm -hmm. to connect this solenoid, that's what I remember, connect this solenoid with this solenoid, <clears throat> And uh, I was told, uh, be careful, don't screw it up. <laughs> and, uh, but fortunately, we had engineers and mm -hmm. managers that checked all your work. Yeah. <laughs> that was an interesting period of time. Too. Had you met anybody special? Any special girlfriend or by this time? Or? Uh, I was, uh, yes, I met my wife there. Oh. My wife was uh, working in the legal department of Low and Stone. <clears throat> attorneys on uh, Wilshire Boulevard and she uh, came from Minneapolis with uh, several of her girlfriends. Mm -hmm. They had a home, they rented a studio apartment in, uh, right off of Wilshire Boulevard near, uh, at that time, Rodeo Road. What was her name and her maiden her name? Her name was Betty Robbins. Her maiden name was Betty Robbins and uh, she grew up in Austin, Minnesota, home of Hormel. Home of what? Hormel. Oh yeah, right. Hormel Packing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. The home of Hormel Packing, Spam. <laughs> that connects right. Hormel. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> she worked as a legal uh, uh, secretary. What What did her father do? Uh, Betty's father uh, grew up in the depression. He was a uh, from the depression. Uh, I believe the story goes that uh, his father-in-law, my father-in-law's father-in-law, back about uh, 33, 35 and so on, uh, there was no work for jobs and so on. And so he gave, I believe my father-in-law said that he gave him, at that time, he loaned him $200 he says, take this money and go with your bride, and my mother-in-law, and go as far as the 200 will take you. 
and he said he had a beat up old car. He decided to go south because he had a cousin that was living in Albert Lee, Minnesota, 20 miles west of Austin. He decided he would go to Austin because it's a big factory there, mm -hmm. or mill. And he drove down on the $200. Hormel's about, uh, Austin's about 100 miles south of Minneapolis. <clears throat> and uh, they got to Austin, Minnesota. And they figured, well, this is where we're going to stay. And uh, he had, uh, he did some bookkeeping work. <clears throat> and uh, he, he decided to go into the furniture business. I don't know how he figured he'd go into the furniture business. So he rented a store. He rented a store, and he'd go out to Minneapolis with a truck and pick up used furniture, pick up uh, beat up old furniture, used furniture, drive back to Austin, refinish it a little bit, touch it up, at that time, he had rented a store, a small storefront, and he peddled the furniture from that place. And at that time, uh, the depression was still on. And so he made whatever sort of a living. He lived above the store. He rented a store that had an apartment above it. And uh, my, uh, my wife said she grew up above the store always. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and their, uh, her ancestors, where did they come from in the old country? Or? My wife's ancestors? Mm -hmm. I would venture to say they came from possibly Russia mm -hmm. or Poland. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, cannot, I cannot recall too much background on that area there. Yeah. Okay. So and you, how did you meet them in L.A.? I met my wife in L.A. She was working there. Right. But I mean, how did you, did, when did you, where did you first see her or meet her? Do you remember how? Uh, a friend of mine uh, asked me, he said, uh, shall we, uh, he says, uh, do you want to go, uh, you want to go on a date, a double date at that time? I said, for sure. He says, I know these, uh, he says, I know these cult. At that time, the word was chicks. I know these chicks in Beverly Hills. <clears throat> and he says, and uh, they're from uh, the Midwest, Milwaukee, Chicago, and so on. So I said, well, sure, I'll go along. So uh, we went to, uh, my wife was sharing an apartment with about three or four other girls. They had a studio apartment in Beverly Hills which was near the Rodeo, uh, on Roxbury Drive, I think, yeah. Studio apartment. <clears throat> and she worked, all of the girls, uh, some of the girls were from Milwaukee, the others from uh, Minneapolis. She worked as a secretary there. She cooked. She couldn't tolerate doing the dishes. And she <laughs> says, I did the cooking. They did the cleanup and so on. <clears throat> I met her there. Uh, for the first time, and uh, I said to myself, now, when I met her in the apartment, I said, now this is classy because she had a, she wore a, a suit, a suit and high heels. I never gone out of, you know, with a girl that had a suit on and high heels. I mean, this is big time. And uh, I dated her for a while there. And then uh, she said, I'd like you to meet my parents. <laughs> I thought they lived in L.A. No, she says they live in the Midwest in Minnesota. <laughs> Where's Minnesota? I don't remember. Oh, it's near Illinois. <laughs> and so I went back and I met them. And, uh, And then after that, uh, I proposed to her when uh, we got back into uh, Los Angeles. So, uh, 
So what year did you get married then? We got married in 1954. In 1954. What kind of, what car were you, what kind of car were you driving in those days? I was driving I was driving a Chevy I was driving a Chevy Impala. Four door turquoise. No. <laughs> four door turquoise. A lot of aluminum. Mm -hmm. Uh a lot of aluminum and uh on the side of the rear door there was a little glass vase with a flower in it. Oh. <laughs> it's a carryover from the older days and yeah. so on. <laughs> and uh, I uh, loved that car. I just mm -hmm. loved that car. I got pictures of it. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, you look back at it, it's, uh, it's a whole different did time you, and space. Yeah. Did you get it brand new when you bought it? I can't recall. <laughs> I think I bought it was used. Mm -hmm. I think I bought it with the car was used. <clears throat> I used that. I used the car there. We drove back to L.A. I mean, we, I'm sorry. We drove from L.A. After we were married, we drove from L.A. back to uh, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I lived in uh, Austin, decided to live in uh, Austin, Minnesota. I went into business with my father-in-law down there. Oh, okay. Well, he still had the furniture store? Well, no, this was quite a large store. This uh, was, I thought, oh, okay. This was a furniture store that had uh, <coughs> carpeting and drapes and uh, uh, tile. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, workmen working for him, uh, putting in uh, for Mica countertops and various things. So uh, I drove that car back there. And uh, we built a house. Uh, we built a house in Austin. And we, got a, we bought a refrigerator, turquoise. As a matter of fact, we had a lot of turquoise in the house <laughs> to match the Turkish, turquoise Chevrolet. <laughs> So, <laughs> my uh, daughter Shelley was born in Austin, Minnesota. There. Okay. And uh, you have how many children did you? I have get? two, and uh, we. Ha I have a son who's uh, eight years younger than Shelley, and uh, he's a uh, he's adopted. He's adopted, and. Uh, we lived in, uh, uh, we sold a home. We sold a home in uh, Austin. <coughs> we moved up to the city. We, uh, I was used, we wanted to move into a larger city. I couldn't quite adjust to a smaller town. And so uh, we moved into, L into Minneapolis. We've resided uh, there ever since. St. Louis Park area, is that where you moved to right away? Oh, we moved into uh, St. Louis Park, yeah. Okay. What part of Minneapolis is that? That's a suburb. It's a, uh, a suburb, a small suburb. Mm -hmm. A small suburb of uh, Minneapolis. And uh, it was uh, easy for my wife to uh, go to work. She went to work, and I went to work. She went to work. Uh, it was easy at that time because it was on good bus lines and you can mm -hmm. navigate to your destinations quite easily now. What kind of job did she have then there? She worked, uh, she worked for a law offices mm -hmm. uh, all of her life there. And what did you do and what, what kind of work did you do there? So there I had done a number of uh, various jobs. <clears throat> Uh, I did advertising, uh, uh, small advertising work for myself, and uh, then I, uh, I, uh, somewhere along the line, I this I uh, went back to Los Angeles and spoke with uh, my uh, relatives, my uncle, 
who was a uh, Holocaust survivor, and he was living in Los Angeles, and he was just uh, starting to import diamonds from uh, Israel, a diamond dealer. And uh, he asked me if, if I'm familiar with the area there, why don't, uh, he says, uh, why don't you try peddling some of my stones? Which I did for a while, and then I decided, for a while meant uh, a number of years, and then I decided to uh, go ahead and go out on my own. And so uh, I started my own business. Uh, uh, diamonds? Diamonds, importing diamonds, color stones, various things. Oh. Hey, hey, did you keep your hand in art all, this, all these years? Yes. Uh, most, uh, <clears throat> most of the business that I had uh, been associated with had <clears throat> something that has some uh, artistic uh, connection to it. It was from the draftsmanship and the advertising layout and blocking and so on. And in the, uh, uh, even in the furniture business was the sketching and laying out of ads. Uh, in the, jewelry business and the jewelry business required uh, highly detailed sketches a presentation of the product it could be a bracelet earrings necklaces and so on but it required sketching laying out detailed centimeters and millimeters for the sizes of the gems to fit the hard mechanicals of the uh, the metal, like uh, gold and brass and 18-karat uh, gold. So you're dealing with a hard metal, but things had to be made, designed. It had to be sketched up, carved by hand in the wax design, and then we go into the manufacture of the product also. I had been doing uh, artwork uh, all of my life. My, uh, even when I was in business, I had, uh, I, when I was not traveling, I would always go to uh, art studios, art schools, uh, to bone up and uh, keep myself active in the field of, uh, of painting and drawing and so on. And I think you said now you from time to time, you uh, you teach art. I teach art, and uh, when my wife and I goes back some time, <clears throat> when my wife and I would go to uh, Los, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for winter vacations, <clears throat> I would go into what they call the snowbird classes, and from there, uh, I was asked at a number of classes. Uh, since I was more prolific, advanced. I would paint, <clears throat> help them out. I, I would do this. And so uh, every year when I go back to uh, Fort Lauderdale and so on, I go into the studios and I would paint in uh, classes and I would help other students here. Uh, going back to Minneapolis and so on, I had done the same thing. I kept up with uh, <clears throat> art ateliers, which are a French word for school, and I would paint. And these were the very uh, classical type of work, so highly detailed in anatomy and color formulation and layout and conception. Are the students pretty young that you work with? The students uh, vary upon the, uh, the time of the year. By that I mean if you're going out to California, if you're going out to uh, Florida, anywhere, Mexico, wherever it is warm, and you're having, you have travelers, people that are visiting. You have schools. There's museums, so there will be schools there. And so classes go on all, of, all over the world here. And uh, 
I always kept myself occupied with this, in as much as I'm not a golfer or play tennis of that sort. Uh, you know, I figured four hours on a golf course, I could be doing four hours of what I like, you yeah. see. <laughs> and I think you mentioned that uh, you've been out here for a couple months now. Exactly. And you're about ready to go back, and mm -hmm. they're already after you to come back and uh, <coughs> teach some more. Yeah? They miss you. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I have a studio. <coughs> while I'm not in this, while I'm not in the school studio, I use the uh, the facility of where we're staying. We're staying at the Rancho Mirage in Palm Springs. I use the facility where the light is right, and that would happens to be a garage. Oh. The garage. Is the street exit too, and so I have the golf carts that go by, and they wave, and I'm painting outside with the open garage door, mm. and I have the bikers, and the walkers, and they buy, mm. pass by, and they see me painting in the garage for hours on end. So I have met a lot of people walking by. They want to stop. They want information, <laughs> and uh, I had uh, one woman that, as an example, stop by. And she says, I'm taking classes, but I'm having difficulty doing composition and blending of colors. And can you give me uh, a lesson for a, a little while? I said, you're more than welcome, which she did. She stopped by and brought all of her supplies. And uh, the lesson I thought would probably end up to be maybe about an hour. It was a four hour lesson, four hour session. And She's painting, and I'm helping her. It was a lot of fun, oh, very, very much fun. Yeah. But when you get back, you're leaving. I think you said the, uh, this weekend, but you'll you, you'll be doing some teaching when you get back. Yes, I've already been in touch with the uh, <coughs> the uh, Jewish Community Center. Uh, I give my time there, so I uh, I have uh, people in the class there that are. Uh, in the professions could be doctors, engineers, uh, advertising people. Uh, they're going back to their uh, first love before they went into a career of making a living for themselves rather than the art. And so now they're comfortable and so they come and they take classes there. And uh, I go in and I uh, and I help them along with their in the use of acrylic paints or oil paints or watercolor. It's, uh, it's uh, very beneficial, it's a challenge, and uh, yeah. it's and, very helpful. And um, what, what is your son's name? My son's name is Corey. And where does he live? Corey lives in uh, uh, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. about a mile and a half away from me, the same as my daughter. She lives about a mile and a half away from me also. Okay. And he's in the uh, call center business, <clears throat> completely opposite of what my profession was. What kind of business? Call centers. <clears throat> uh, the company is called Outsource Consultants. These are call centers. In other words, I'll give you an example. Uh, wherever there are 800 numbers, wherever you need information, let's say, for example, you want to order Nike tennis shoes, or you want to order an automobile, a rental, you need information on uh, health care. These are call, uh, you call up the call centers. Oh, call center. Call okay, centers, gotcha. the call centers pick up these calls. Okay. Call centers can range all over the world. They can be in the Philippines in India, South, in Africa, and so on. He is the broker for them. He arranges, he puts the buyer and the seller together. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to simplify this very, very simply here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it goes into, everything is highly detailed now, mm -hmm. and it's all of communications and so on. Does he have a family? He has a family. He has a, a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, the daughter is about 21 years old, 22. She's graduating uh, this coming May from uh, is it uh, Arizona? In uh, I think it's Tucson. Is it Arizona Ar State? Yeah, Arizona is in Tucson. <laughs> the University of Arizona. Yes, and his Tucson. son, who's uh, in his, finishing his first year of college, in the same uh, 
same college oh, here okay. in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And I what have, are their names? Uh, her name is Abby Kotlars. Mm -hmm. His name is uh, Eli Kotlars. Mm -hmm. He was named after my, uh, my in-laws. Yeah. And her mom, uh, their, uh, or his wife, what's her name? Her name is Lisa, Lisa Kotlars. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, has her own business. And she uh, sells uh, high-end used clothing, mm -hmm. uh, bags, purses, and various things over the internet. Oh, okay. Completely opposite of uh, her husband. <laughs> yeah. And Shelly, what uh, what kind of work does she do? Shelly uh, works on in uh, the field of uh, <coughs> communication, and uh, but mostly in the healthcare in, this, in the healthcare business here, mm -hmm. uh, marketing, mm -hmm. representing clients, <coughs> and. Uh, She's been doing this for many, many years. She's also a uh, a single parent, and oh. she has a daughter who is just turned 19. Yeah, what's her name? Her name is Adriana, mm -hmm. Adriana Kolfas. Is she going to college now? Uh, yeah, Adriana. she'll be starting college. Mm -hmm. She uh, is also, uh, a, my daughter is a single parent, <coughs> And she's an, uh, her daughter's an adopted child. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, from China. I was born in. Uh, I was actually born in Austin, Minnesota, where my folks were living, and mm -hmm. uh, they moved to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I was around uh, three, four years old. Would you say, Dad? About that, yes. Yeah. Yep. And so I was raised in uh, in Minneapolis, an okay. area called St. Louis Park. Enjoyed a lot of friends. I was raised with a uh, solid Jewish upbringing. I was involved in um, Jewish life in our community. I did uh, gymnastics, and I loved to sing and do theater. Yeah. And your wife, uh, she's passed on then. My wife passed away about uh, four and a, about four and a half years ago. Yeah. Okay. So, and you were married for how many years were you married? To? Sixty-three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good run. Long run. Oh yeah. Uh, that was really good. So, sounds like you've adjusted fairly well. To yeah, pretty much so. I have. Yeah. Got, it's it's good you have all these other your interests, particularly your art and. Yeah, interests. I do that. Yeah. Uh, that keeps me going, and uh, yeah, I do a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, I travel uh, where I feel I want to go and so on. Did you and your wife do much traveling? We traveled, uh, we traveled to Europe, and, uh, but most of the time, uh, outside of the traveling, uh, we spent uh, on our vacation time mostly in uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. We spent there about 35 to 40 years yeah. for the winter months in Florida. Did you have a place down there? Or? Uh, no, we rented there for uh, two to three months. Same place all the time, pretty much? Or? Uh, it would vary. Mm -hmm. It would vary upon uh, the ownership of the property and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, How many times have you been coming to <coughs> our area here? During the winter? My wife and I used to travel when we were uh, living in Austin. And we were living in Minneapolis, so we'd come out to California for the summer, the summertime, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not into Palm Springs. This would be Los Angeles, because mm -hmm. Los Angeles, we had friends there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we had friends there. So that was the reason. Uh, we had no uh, relatives or friends here. This was uh, way out for us, mm -hmm. and uh, we said, why do we want to go to the desert? There's nobody here then. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this time goes by, uh, lost our friends have passed away, they've become incapacitated. And so the, uh, the visiting to California diminished. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we started going to uh, the Fort Lauderdale area. Mm -hmm. And why was that? Because uh, my in-laws, when they retired, they moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale. Right. 
And so we went to visit him. And after visiting him a few years, we figured, well, why stay in a motel or a hotel? We might as well rent the place or so on. Mm -hmm. And so that started our journey to Florida. Were you ever down there during spring break? Uh, yes, every year. <laughs> How was, what was that like? That was chaos there. <laughs> Uh, we stayed. We always stayed. Uh, we always uh, stayed on uh, these high rises that run up and down the uh, 95 corridor coast, and we'd always we we're always on a high rise. And so, uh, about March spring madness over here, it uh, we'd go down there, and uh, areas of the beach was uh, were closed off. And uh, it was uh, it was a circus. It was really a circus. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting because here's here are all these young people that are going to be our future leaders of this country, <laughs> behaving this manner. And uh, you're figuring, my God Almighty, I'm worried about the future of the country. This has been going on for many many years, and so on. But it lent a certain color and vitality. <laughs> amusing, amusing time. Uh, I first met uh, my companion. Her name is uh, Dory Rose. She's from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She, uh, she's out here. We're staying together at one of the uh, condominiums in Rancho Mirage. She has. Uh, relatives that reside here and uh, also uh, live in Minneapolis, but they come back here for uh, several months of the year. And uh, she has been uh, my, uh, uh, my friend and companion, or girlfriend if you want to put it, uh, uh, for about three years or so on right now here. <clears throat> she uh, has one son and one daughter uh, living, and her husband has passed away about uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, and so on. Uh, she's highly educated. She is a very, very intelligent woman here. Uh, great sense of humor, very strong willed, uh, loves politics, <clears throat> loves to politics. She was uh, in her apartment on the wall are uh, countless uh, certificates ex in excellence from the university and uh, a phenomenal memory. <clears throat> Loves to play bridge, which I do not. And uh, she, uh, I met her she uh, came into my art class at the Jewish Community Center in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. <coughs> uh, she was in a, in a writing class and she was asked to leave the writing class not come back because she was asking too many questions and beginning into political mischief there. <laughs> so she wandered into uh, a my class by mistake. Dory Rose. <laughs> and she wondered, oh, Speaking of, <laughs> I better hold this. Yeah, talk to her. Put her on. Let's, well, let's hear her. I'm giving you praise. Oh my God! What now? What are you? Okay, I'm going to put you on camera. I'm going to give you praise for a second. <laughs> are you still there? Hey, Dory. Hi. We're just talking Hi. about you. Well, this is Dave. This is his uh, interviewer. Uh, oh, David. Uh, yes, hey. I'm, I'm the, the Hollywood, uh, <laughs> the Hollywood uh, Times. The, the uh, LA. I'm from the LA Times, and we are oh, interviewing yeah. him for don't, a big spread. Don't let him show you what those silly little stories about his childhood. I said, <laughs> <laughs> you were king. And no, he, he's talking about your childhood. Oh, yeah, well, mine is boring. You know, born in the same place, Minneapolis. <laughs> nothing, nothing changed. Um, so you're having a good time. Well, we are indeed. Don't All right. Don't believe everything he 
Okay, now listen, I have to go. <laughs> Let's get back to me. <laughs> she has relatives galore here. That's it, yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Did some uh, of them live here all the time, you mean? Uh, yeah, some of them live here. Oh, okay. At the Springs, the Rancho Mirage, oh, and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, are we on camera now? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we were <laughs> so, anyhow, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, she wandered into the art class and uh, uh, she disrupted the class by uh, her various comments <laughs> and so on, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was hilarious. <laughs> Her background, her t her background, is in art, not as an artist, but as a docent for various museums. Oh. So she spent about uh, 35 years with Minneapolis, uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, as a docent, taking uh, groups of people to Europe, uh, to the various uh, countries there, and uh, these would be. Uh, tours on art, the history of art, and its policies and pol uh, the po uh, political upheavals of uh, the churches and the countries which uh, centered in uh, art presentation here. Mm -hmm. She would also take groups on theater excursions to various parts of Europe. And... Uh, what kind? Pardon? What kind of excursions? Theater groups, theater, the cultural groups. Oh, okay. And theater, writing groups. Th oh, theater, uh, theater. 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 Okay, yeah. theater groups. Uh, yeah, the, I got gotcha. uh, Theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so her, her background in art is quite extensive here. <clears throat> and uh, she is a, a good presentation uh, person. She in, likes uh, the classic art. She's very, very prolific in the classic art and so on. Uh, a docent requires a great deal of uh, art history and understanding, mm -hmm. psychology, how to read paintings and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a sketch, as, a, uh, as an artist, she's fairly good, <laughs> except she's a little bit lazy. She doesn't, <laughs> she'd rather play bridge than paint. <laughs> And her uh, ancestors, do you know where they all came from? I think her ancestors, from what I <coughs> understand, it would be uh, mostly uh, from Germany, a background mm -hmm. from Germany itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's had, uh, I'll add this in, she's had four children. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a daughter that passed away mm. of cancer, and she was an attorney. And I think maybe about three years ago, or two years, three to three years ago, she had a son who was an architect living here in uh, Palm Springs. And uh, he passed away of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has two remaining children. Yeah. So... Uh, Are they back in Minnesota, the other children? Her children, her daughter, lives in Washington, D.C., and uh, her, uh, she has granddaughters, too, there, <clears throat> and her son, he lives in uh, Colorado, outside of Denver, in some small little area. <laughs> uh, I admire her very much, I care for her very much. And uh, she's a, uh, a great companion. Well, I think you're both lucky to have each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I think we might be about ready to wrap it up. Do you have any parting thoughts, Lou? I just want to say this here. Uh, I think I made a sort of small political statement when I mentioned this before, and that is basically that uh, the future of this country depends upon its young people and its morals, the moral fiber of it. What is going on? I firmly believe that every boy and girl, I could have said it before, that reaches the age of 18 should give their time, <clears throat> should go into the service, or the government should mandate that they give 
18 months of their life to this country's service. Kind and, of President Kennedy's idea. And also uh, working overseas. If they don't wish to go on the service, they shall donate time. Peace Corps. The Peace Corps okay, overseas okay. Mm -hmm. in various countries. I think it's imperative that we have a background of people that have experienced the service. It was, it is an eye opener for them, it's for the welfare of this country. There are many services, many countries that have this obligations necessary. I think you'd have a safer country. I think. I think the individuals would have a, it's a moral imperative that they understand this thing. I think the, the ground would be leveled out for all. Uh, it, would, it would give them an idea of what goes on amongst the various classes in this country is turning into class of all kinds. Uh, The alternative is not looking very good at this moment when this uh, presentation is being made here. But uh, at all times, as my generation is dissipating or going away, their background and their children have a responsibility to all of us veterans from the Civil War until now and going on. What we did for them to have the obligation and the right to uh, partake in what they have in their hands right now and for their children. I agree. I think that's well said. And God bless America. <laughs> there you go. Lou, thank you. I want to thank you so much thank for you your very service. Much. Thanks for I appreciate it. your service to our country and thanks for coming and sharing with us today. Thank you. And God bless you, my man. Thank you. Tomorrow all the things were gone I'd work for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away The men who died, who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt